Welcome to the Bob Balance HealthCast, episode number 321, an interview with Dr. Rachel Sullivan. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome. This week we want to have a conversation with the newest member of our staff, Dr. Rachel Sullivan, who runs our office in Kansas City. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. I'd like to get to know you and have the people that watch uh, our HealthCast get to know you a little bit. So mm-hmm. um, we'd like to just ask you some generic questions about your training, your education, your focus as a physician. Okay. So you went to undergraduate school where? I actually went to University of San Diego. University of San Diego. <laughs> yeah. And your undergraduate degree was? I was a, I had a bachelor's of business administration and a minor in biology. Awesome preparation for a doctor. <laughs> well, I figured that at some point as a physician, you have to learn how to run a business effectively mm-hmm. in order to st- keep your head above water and continue to practice. So I figured... Where, where did you learn that <laughs> as a reality of life? I can't believe that. I must have learned that from my mother and also my partner. And she won't say and that from all my mistakes. Yeah. When, I, when I didn't have a business degree and had to hire people to teach me business, basically. So Dr. Sullivan is your daughter. Yes. And she is not the same kind of physician that you are. You, before you got into hormonal medicine as your focus, were uh, OBGYN. Right. And Dr. Sullivan, what is your medical specialty? Uh, I'm a family medicine practitioner. Family medicine. And I don't Mm -hmm. really know what that means. I mean, I know all the different labels for things that doctors do, but they go over my head. So tell us a little bit about family medicine. So as a family medicine practitioner, I actually get to do a little bit of everything. Uh, I take care of people from birth to death. From cradle to grave. So yeah. in theory, um, mo- well, most family practitioners get training from the nursery to labor and delivery and then get to take care of all adult medicine and chronic medical problems as well. Um, I went to a very strong residency where I actually got to do all of those things almost 24 hours a day every day. So I got a lot of experience. So you have residency episodes or cycles that focus on all the different levels of treatment? Yes. And sometimes all of it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fun. Which it, how do you keep that from swarming on you? Uh, you just, well, I have a little bit of ADD, so it's, I guess, what you, as you're saying, it's, well, it's pretty good. It's a compensatory good. strategy. You know? <laughs> it's good because I get to, uh, I have a little bit of attention at everything at all times and that actually helps me succeed. I've done a lot of work as a counselor with people with ADD. And that is what we strive for, those compensatory strategies that use the ability to absorb a lot of data streams mm-hmm. at the same time and know how to channel the focus. Right. And that's something you're really good at. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's <laughs> awesome. So you began then coming out of med school. You did your residency all over the country. You, you had locations yes. for that. I, uh, I went to medical school at A.T. Still University, which is the very, is the very first osteopathic medical school in the world. Um, I started, uh, some of my rotations were in Arizona, some were in South Carolina and small rural towns. Uh, and then I really traveled all over the country for my fourth year to, uh, see where the biggest medical need was for me, uh, to take on with my residency. I, uh, ended up in Houston, Texas, which is a huge city, but it also has a huge medical need. Um, with a lot of people who don't have medical, uh, continuing medical care. And so I um, was able to be that for a lot of people. So one of the things that we've talked about in different podcasts is the shift in the United States towards uh, a high volume population that doesn't have medical insurance and ends up going to the emergency room for almost everything, whether it's a cold or the flu or pregnancy or heart attack. Right. So you had an opportunity to field all of those incoming rounds. Yes, I was at there the same for, time. Yes, I was there for all of that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, until my up until my last year in residency, we didn't have an urgent care associated with our hospitals. So uh, in my last year, we got to say, "Oh, it's a runny nose. Please go to the urgent care, um, where a nurse practitioner could easily take or a PA." So you have to triage that somewhat mm-hmm. to get better 
Function yeah, service. But up until my last year, I was, was all triage. of that all yeah. at once. You were the triage. Yeah, I was the triage, and I was the heart attacks, and I was delivering babies all in the ER, all wow. you know, within the same 25 so, minutes. <laughs> I can't imagine dealing with any of that. I mean, somebody gets a cut, and I'm calling for help. <laughs> I don't know what to do. But what was the most innervating or exciting thing that you've experienced as a physician with, with the responsibility yes. to not panic, to not run away, to say, okay, I can do this. Yeah. I had a class on this. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? Well, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is when I worked in, when I was working OB, my OB rotations, uh, we got a call from the emergency room and they called and they just said a baby had died. A baby was dead. And that we asked more, we were running and asking, they're like, the baby's dead, uh, the mom was trying to deliver it at home, and it's dead. And we were terrified. We started running, we ran down as fast as we could, and it turned out the baby was just a breech baby. And so when the baby comes out breech, the biggest part is the head. So in right. theory, with the regular delivery, the head comes out first. Right. After, as soon as you get the head out, that's your smooth sailing, much, yeah. everything else comes Smart. out. Yeah. yeah, but with this breech baby, the baby was almost completely out, except the head was stuck. But the whole body was blue, but that's actually the body, the baby compensating uh, because the head has Keeping not. Keeping the oxygen in the, mm -hmm. in the brain. Yes, so uh, we, I was very calm. <laughs> I don't even think I put on gloves at that point because I, you know, we had to work quickly, right. but I had a lot of training on how to deliver in lots of emergency situations. So I was able to deliver the baby safely. Baby's great now. Uh, he's, oh, proud. Last time I saw him, he was three. Um, he was doing great, and he's meeting you know, all of his milestones. I, I think one of the most phenomenal awarenesses that I've obtained in listening to stories that Kathy tells is the incredible resilience of the human organism, the, yes. the drive to, to survive. Yes, it's it incredible. It's unbelievable. And you mm -hmm. get in situations where people should be dead, like mm -hmm. that baby, mm -hmm. and they're not dead, and they, and they can recover. Right. With the right help. Yes. And it was it was really incredible. It was a great yeah. thing to see. And the mom was okay? Mom was great. Wow. She was on her fourth kid, so she, you know, she thought she, she could do it. She had a spare. It. Yeah. She, <laughs> <laughs> she thought she could do it at home, just like she had done the rest of them. But that's where uh, prenatal care is very, very important because yeah. she wouldn't have known either way if the kid was right side up or upside down. So after an experience like that, you didn't reconsider, so you know what, I want to do OBGYN like my mom? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> So I chose family medicine for a reason. Uh, I chose family medicine because I really wanted to be proficient in OBGYN, but I did not want the hours and the stress um, that came with being an OBGYN. I know that my mom worked really hard um, raising me, but she just could not be there for a lot of things because she had to be there for other people. And, right. and so that was hard for me when I was 12. It's easy for me to understand now, right. but it was a little more difficult. So I just thought that if I could become just as good at OBGYN, but not actually have to practice it long term, mm -hmm. that's where I would like to be. So that's why I chose family medicine. So you had a choice growing up. You had two professional careers prevented, presented for you to study yes. and see from the inside out. One yes. was medicine, one was law. Yes. And you chose medicine. Yes, I did. Why? <laughs> well, I chose medicine because I like helping people in that in that aspect. I like helping them control things that sometimes are genetic, some things that they were just born with. Some people just have high blood pressure because their parents had high blood pressure. That's an important thing to, to, Same for with to know. Cholesterol it's and, not all just diet. Yeah, sometimes it's not anything that they could control. I mean, I have lots of patients who are who run marathons, have, you know, 10% body fat and still have blood pressure problems and are on two to three medications. Right. Um, it's just sometimes is, is it it's hard just to the explain way to them that this is just a genetic anomaly and we have to regulate it, but you're always going to have it. Sometimes it's relieving to the patient <laughs> because they're it's not their fault. Yeah, it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, some people are frustrated that be, you know that's, but it's just the way they were born. It's just like uh, your hair color, your eye color. It's just it is it is what it is and. The sooner you can accept that and go forward, the better off you are in the future. So in med school, and mm -hmm. you're a DO, not yes. an MD. You, yes. you went to a school, the mm -hmm. first medical school for osteopathic. Yes. yes sir. So in medical school, did you get counseling courses? 
We did get a few of them. Well, you're um, talking about a lot of counseling <laughs> skills. We did get a few of them. Um, I think the best part about my training was that they took me to a rural area where I was not, um, I was alone a lot of the times. I had to take care of people by myself as a second year medical student, which I was, I mean, that's unheard of for a lot of clinics. Um, I spent my entire second year with, you know, supervision by an attending, but they would kind of let me go and take what care an of awesome people. Experience. And then they would come back and say, you know, this is what we can change or, you know, they, but they like gave me a lot of um, opportunities to talk and counsel and help make some decisions on my own early. So I that was, was my experience when I became a school teacher. You have, mm -hmm. you have to take a training class and they put you in a classroom with a supervising instructor. Yeah. I went in the very first day, and my supervising instructor said, I have to be gone the entire time you're here. Yeah. We've hired a substitute who is a home ec teacher. I was a social studies teacher. Yeah. She said, she's going to be here because of the legal stuff, but mm -hmm. you have to teach the class. I'll be back in six weeks. I want it to be here. And she left. And so I'm, yeah, and it I, was like, okay, I have to do this. Yeah, it, I, I, think, I think it's a really good thing that a lot of medical schools probably should do because it makes you take responsibility for your actions, it makes you want to know things better. Yes, uh, There's because a for that. yes, because you want to do what's right, what's right for your patients, and you want to do what's best, and you want to know everything because sometimes you're the first person that they see, and what's wrong with me? And you can't say, "Oh, I don't know. Let me ask my attending really quick. I'll be <laughs> yeah, back in yeah. three hours." Uh -huh. So it's a lot easier um, to be say you have pneumonia or. Uh, Yes, you've broke or you've broken your hand, but I already have ortho called, and we can take care of this. And in South Carolina, a lot of it was uh, you stepped on a lot of oyster shells. <laughs> Let me take all of those out for you so, one by one. <laughs> so, two major issues in American culture today mm -hmm. are uh, methamphetamines mm -hmm. and other drugs, and the whole heroin and opioid issue. Absolutely. Do you see a lot of that as a family physician? Uh, not so much anymore, but in, in medical school and residency, we would see it every once in a while. Um, usually a lot of people overdose at home and you don't really get to see that part. You get to see a lot of the drug seekers that come in and they say, I have a headache and the only thing that works for me is like fentanyl or Dilaudid, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then they say, can you send me home with uh, Vicodin, but these are the doses. Well, while we're here, my mother needs a prescription for yeah. this, my uncle needs a prescription yeah. for that, can I get those while I'm exactly. here? Exactly, yeah. and they say, you know, yeah. this is the dose that works for me, when you know, like, yeah. that's not like a typical Ten normal. normal dose, they yeah. built up that tolerance. Yeah, and, you, yeah. and then they, you give them, you know, five, because they're causing a scene, and then they cause a scene again, because you only gave them five, and... Then they'll call you uh, later, oh, I lost my prescription. Uh, so you got a lot of that. So you have to learn mm -hmm. to manage that as well. That manipulation yeah. is part of the process. Yeah. What was the saddest thing that you experienced as a physician? I think the saddest thing for me is, uh, or was and still is, having uh, diabetics who are insulin dependent uh, not be able to afford their insulin. Um, it's very, very common. Sense. Yes. Um, I had quite a few newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics where the only thing you really can take is insulin and you need insulin to live. And when insulin costs more than what your paycheck is, it's pretty, it's pretty devastating. Uh, you sometimes just want to reach in your own pocket and try to buy or contribute to help. Um, there are a lot of hospital programs that can help with that, but you do have to provide a lot of uh, paperwork. Creative ways for people yes. to get the access. Yeah. You know, I don't know when insulin became expensive, but it was very cheap when I went to medical mm -hmm. school, as in the cheapest drug you could take. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that's depressing. I yeah. didn't even know that. And uh, we used to, so we used to get around that by prescribing instead of long-acting insulin and short-acting insulin, we would basically prescribe something called 7030, which was a lot cheaper. Uh, and we used to prescribe Is it that. The end of the two? Yes. Okay. And uh, so instead of short acting long, it's kind of like in the middle acting. Right. Uh, and it would be two, at least two injections a day. And we used to prescribe that instead. And I think, you know, you always want to think the best of people, but drug companies, I think, got wind of that, that we were actually using that medication again. And that's yeah. how we were using it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
it, the prices on that went up as well. So it's sure. been uh, pretty, it's difficult then and it's difficult now as well to, um, you know, can you, you know, can you feed your kids or can you give yourself your insulin? And it's sad and it's angry making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really frustrating. So you are a family physician and you work as a family physician in Kansas City. You wear two hats and work for yes. two companies. The yes. other company that you work for is BioBalance Health. Yes, I do. And you are in, in the process of becoming the, the, the face of the Kansas City office. Yes. What, how do you feel about transitioning into or, or straddling so that you're also mm -hmm. doing hormone replacement therapy? I love it. I actually, I found a lot of times in my primary care practice, uh, patients would come to me with hot flashes, with depression, depressed mood, low sex drive, um, trouble in their marriage because of a lot of those things, weight, weight gain especially, um, really is frustrating to a lot of people. And um, when I was in Houston before I could be trained, um, before I had, you know, licenses and that kind of thing, um, I, you know, you couldn't, there were no people providing this type of hormone replacement. Right. And it was very hard to say, well, I know what's wrong with you. Um, here's a patch that might work uh, and your insurance won't cover it probably. And here's a, a cream that won't work. Oh, you can't <laughs> touch your kids with it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to grow hair wherever you put it. Oh, and your insurance 100% will not cover that. And it's right. going to be over $100 a month. It's hard for people to, to justify that. Yeah. And so then I would just say, that, you know, I would say, you know, I have options for you if you came to St. Louis or Kansas City. Uh, but right now, but we are in Houston and, uh, you know, I don't have I don't have anything for you. And Actually, I don't know if you know, but we have a couple of doctors from Houston area that are coming up for training in January. That's so exciting because so it was very, yeah, it was very yeah. difficult uh, being, being, feeling helpless. Yes. Uh, and I fe I like that I can do both primary care as well as hormone replacement because uh, a lot of that goes hand in hand. A lot of my patients or a lot of our patients, they come to see us and they say, well, uh, you know, my sugar's a little up, but my doctor told me not to worry about it. And I'll say, well, how high is it? And they, they'll tell me, and I'll say, well, you have prediabetes. They're telling you not to worry about it because you don't have diabetes yet. Right. But as a family practitioner, I've always been taught preventive care. You want to treat things before anything bad happens. Mm -hmm. You want to treat things like when you, when you become a diabetic, you're instantly put on four medications. Four medications you probably weren't on before. Yeah. And but as a pre-diabetic, if you can keep yourself from becoming a diabetic, save you, those four. you will save yourself from taking four medications a day, which is just, to me, um, I just don't understand why, you know, pre-diabetes is not looked at more because that's such a strain on our um, health insurance. That's a strain on the, our patients and the money that they make now is to go to four medications um, at least. And uh, it's just, it's a little, it's it's good for me that we, we get to treat that at our practice now as well. Right. Because we do have that training and I'm bringing that help. Um, and I really, really like doing that. I also really like knowing how to control blood pressures, how to control cholesterol other than with hormone replacement. I really think it's a good benefit mm -hmm. to be able to come to our practice because we can treat not just testosterone or estrogen. We treat a lot of things that make people feel better. Well, you practice medicine there the same way that Dr. Maupin practices mm -hmm. here, which is to spend time with the patient, find out what yes. their symptoms are, and weed them out. I mean, some mm -hmm. of them are not appropriate yet for mm -hmm. hormone replacement. Yes. You're able to say, we have to get your diabetes under control, or we yes. have to get your thyroid under control. Mm -hmm. Come back in five years, and you know, yeah. we'll, we'll track it. Yeah, and a lot of times now we can say, we have the opportunity we don't you don't need testosterone now uh or you you're not in menopause yet but you're feeling miserable miserable right. because of thyroid problems or polycystic ovaries or something on the other something else and we can always help with that we just say yeah wait five years maybe you'll need pellets in five years yeah. but sometimes we can help with other things um to get them feeling their best self since uh you know, a lot of play. A lot of times, we're the last stop, the last, uh, you know, the last pull to feel better. Uh, they've asked a lot of people that they've already trusted and seen for years, haven't had any results, and they come to us, and I say, "Well, you have, you're hypothyroid." Well, I've been asking my other doctor for ten years if I'm hypothyroid, and they, and they just yeah. weren't trained 
uh, efficiently and or well enough to, to recognize well, what's we, abnormal. We want to tell you how excited that <laughs> we are that you have come to our practice <laughs> at, in Kansas City and that you've come to visit with us and we'd like yes. you to come back again Thanks. Uh, later. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thanks. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.